16 17 oh. Hello and welcome back. Today I want to continue talking about filters by looking at one of the most common types of filter out there the LC or inductor capacitor based filter. This type of implementation sees very widespread use, starting from the audio range in things like speaker filters, up to the gigahertz range, where it's commonly found in antenna matching and you have all sorts of other things in between. Now, the thing that makes passive LC filters special in comparison to passive RC filters is that, at least in theory, they are built from lossless, reactive only components. So, in an ideal world, these filters will do their job of filtering certain frequencies, but the signal that does not pass through will be reflected rather than dissipated as heat. A well-designed and built LC filter will present minimal losses even at high power. One of the first things to look at is the fundamental building blocks of LC filters. Now, it should be of no surprise that LC filters are built from inductors and capacitors, but there are a few fundamental arrangements that are worth mentioning. So, for this analysis, we will consider the rough impedance shape of the component, as well as the general attenuation presented when it's placed in series or in parallel. So, for the standalone capacitor, impedance drops as frequency increases, and when the capacitor is placed in series, it presents a high attenuation at low frequency, and this decreases as frequency increases and when it's placed in parallel, we see the opposing effect. Small attenuation at low frequency and high attenuation at high frequency. The inductor is more or less the same, only in reverse. So based on these behaviors, standalone inductors and capacitors are mainly used in high and low pass filters. Now we can construct groups of two reactive components, either have an inductor in series with a capacitor or in parallel. This gives us new impedance shapes, where the variation changes slope after a resonance point. So for the series circuit, impedance starts high, then drops, and then rises, and for the parallel circuit, we have the opposing behavior. So based on whether the elements are in series or parallel, we get a very clear band pass or band stop response, based on how these are connected in the circuit. Now, you can build band pass filters just with the standalone inductors and capacitors, but taking advantage of the series and parallel resonance, you can obtain much narrower responses. So these sort of arrangements are most common when building bandpass or bandstop filters. We can increase the component count, so go for groups of three reactive components, and for this we have four main arrangements that can be summed up into two distinct behaviors. So with these circuits, we see two resonance frequencies appearing, a series and a parallel resonance, and based on which of these circuits is built, the two frequencies can be interchanged. So for our first set, the series resonance occurs at a lower frequency, whereas for the second group, the parallel resonance occurs at the lower frequency. Now, although building filters with this sort of arrangements is not all that common, in particular the two capacitor and one inductor arrangement might look a bit familiar, since this is the equivalent circuit of a quartz crystal. Finally, adding more and more reactive elements increases the number of resonance points. So the last set to look at is a couple of four component circuits, basically groups of two series or two parallel circuits. Here we get two series and one parallel resonance for the first circuit and two parallel and one series resonances for the second set. More and more components can of course be added when needed and this will increase the number of resonance points and will make the response shape a bit more complicated. So, to highlight these behaviors, I will be performing an AC type of simulation, and for measuring the impedance, we can use a current source that has an AC small signal amplitude value of 1. So the impedance will be the voltage in the output net divided by the current, which is 1. So the impedance value will be numerically equal to the voltage value. And to highlight the attenuation behavior, I will be using a generic voltage source with a series impedance of 50 ohms, and a 50 ohm load. So, just to highlight this setup, we can observe the behavior of a standard capacitor. So, if we just plot on a logarithmic scale, we can see the falling impedance behavior, characteristic of a capacitor, as well as the minus 90 degrees of phase shift. For the attenuation behavior, if we look at the series capacitor circuit, 
we can see the high pass filtering effect and when the capacitor is in parallel, we can see the low pass filtering effect. So if we now swap out the capacitor with an inductor, we will see the same behaviors but inverted. So the impedance is rising with a plus 90 degree of phase shift, series circuit presents a low pass behavior and the parallel circuit presents a high pass behavior. Next, if we move to two component circuits, so either series or parallel LC circuits, if we plot out the impedance, we get a resonance, either an impedance peak for the parallel LC circuit or a impedance minimum for the series LC circuit. And if we now look at the various attenuation graphs, so first of all the series and parallel LC circuits, here we no longer get nice looking graphs, since an important consideration is the exact value of the connected impedances. So the shape is as expected, giving us either maximums or minimums, but the exact band pass and band stop widths will vary. And we see a similar story for the parallel LC circuits. So even though I'm using the same components, the series and parallel circuits show slightly different behaviors. So the same corner frequencies are involved, but different shapes are present in the graphs. Finally, we can have a look at four component circuits. So two series circuits in parallel or two parallel circuits in series. Here, as expected, we are getting three inflection points. So based on which configuration is used, we are getting two peaks and one minimum for the double parallel circuits in series and two minimums and one maximum for the double series in parallel circuit. And well, if we look at the attenuation characteristics, so first of all, for the double series circuit, as before, we can see that some peaks are sharper compared to other ones, so you won't always be getting the pretty theoretical graphs. You will get the same general shape, but the exact representation will be highly impacted by the connecting circuitry. And while the double parallel circuit presents a similar story. Now, once the building blocks are clear, making a filter out of them should be as simple as taking the blocks and just putting them in series and parallel. How hard can that be? Now, when designing a filter and analyzing the various possible implementations, it's important to consider not just the signal that passes through, but also the effect of the filter on the signal source. So the most basic ways in which a filter blocks and will let signal pass through is by presenting different impedances at different frequencies. So when a series element is supposed to block, it will have a high impedance, and when it's supposed to let signal through, it will present a low impedance. For the shunt filter, it's the reverse. So from the load side, both of these filters will do the same thing. However, from the signal source side, the behavior will be different. Since during the blocking phase, the signal source will either be driving a very small impedance or a very high impedance. Now, when the block signal is not supposed to go anywhere, this does not make much of a difference. The reflection coefficient, S11, can be the same in both cases. But when you do need to do something useful, then the difference between the two is considerable. So to make this a bit more clear, I want to highlight a few basic circuits. One of these is the basic LC matching circuit. In its simplest form, this can be built with just one inductor and capacitor. One is a series element, one is a shunt. But the thing to observe here is that the shunting element needs to stay on the side with the larger impedance. So the choice between the two arrangements will be done based on comparing the source and load impedance. The arrangement will not be working if this is not taken into account. Another circuit to highlight is the diplexer. This is built with a high and low pass filter, so the low frequency signals are supposed to go to one load and the high frequency signals are supposed to go to the other load. Here it is recommended to use series impedances, so T-type filters. Since you don't want the blocking filter, to take up any of the useful signal which should pass to the other branch. You want to minimize losses since there is always a target load. In contrast, in something like a power distribution network, where you have a bunch of noise sources, like switching converters and various ICs, you want to prevent as much as possible the passage of signal from one point to the other. So noise coming from the power supply is shunted with both filters, so it should not affect the other ICs, but also noise coming from one IC should not be allowed to get to the other ICs. Here, energy conservation is not of interest, 
you want the smallest impedance possible to minimize noise. And in this sort of case, Pi filters are the most common. Now for this, I just want to highlight a few examples. First of all, the case of LC matching. So here I used an online calculator to determine the necessary values to go from a 500 ohm signal source to a 50 ohm load. And in both cases, I used the same components. I just connected them differently. So if we look at the results and look at the signal amplitude on the signal source side, when the circuit is constructed correctly, we are getting our minus six decibel point with zero degrees of phase shift at exactly 10 megahertz, so the frequency for which the circuit was calculated, whereas in the other case, we are getting completely different amplitude and phase values. Similarly, if we compare the signal arriving at the two outputs, only our first circuit has a peak value at the 10 megahertz point. So maximum power transfer only occurs in the upper circuit. Next, we can look at a set of three component filters. So as long as they are built for the same requirements, the output response can be made to be the same. So here we have a set of low pass filters, either implemented as a pi filter or as a T filter. So we get the same response with the same corner frequency and while well, a similar case with the high pass filter. So the output is the same in each pair. However, if we now look on the input side, so starting with the low pass filter, we can see that the signal on the input is completely different. The pi filter in blue will exhibit high attenuation at high frequency, characteristic of a low impedance, whereas the T filter in green exhibits a high impedance, so low attenuation. So if we now put the two sets of filters together to form a diplexer, so once with the pi filters and once with the T filters, if we look at the case of the T filter, so on one branch and the other one, we can see that both outputs present a relatively flat response in their respective frequency ranges. So the high pass branch above about 200 megahertz and the low pass branch roughly below 100 megahertz. And if we look to the load side, we have a more or less flat response around the minus six decibel point indicating that the two loads are well matched to the signal source load. Now, if we look to the pi filter implementation to the two outputs, we are getting a completely different story. None of the outputs are looking as expected. So neither of these is anywhere close to the minus six decibel point. And similarly on the input side, we can see a strong attenuation at every single frequency except in the range where nothing is really supposed to pass. So for the purpose of building a diplexer, this sort of pi filter implementation will not work out that well. Finally, it's time to look at how an LSE filter can be designed. As always, there's quite a lot of documentation out there on how to calculate the filter by hand, but to make life a bit easy, you also have a lot of both online and offline tools. So there is one tool I want to highlight today that I find myself using quite often, which is the LC filter design tool from Marquee Microwave. This is a free online tool that allows you to design all four major types of filter. So your low pass, high pass, band pass, and band stop. And you can also choose the exact response type. So there are six variants here to choose from. And you can also select the exact filter topology that you are interested in, as well as the filter order. Finally, there are some settings regarding the exact frequencies of interest, as well as various other settings like pass band ripple for the Chebyshev, input and output impedance, certain component related limitations. And finally, the components can be either with exact values or coming from standardized sets. Once all of the parameters are set up, you just hit compute and you get the exact filter schematic for the chosen parameters. On the bottom side, you have various characteristic curves. So first of all, you have the S11 and S21 parameters. So your insertion loss and return loss. You can observe the phase and group delay. You can export your touchstone description of the circuit. And finally, you also have the option to export it as a circuit for either LT spice or cukes. And if you run into any troubles, either with setting up the filter or understanding the various curves, there is quite an extensive explanation section on the bottom side regarding how the tool works and what the various settings mean. 
so this is quite a good theoretical support for the application of designing filters. Although the mathematics will let you design any LC filter for any performance criteria, there is a numerical solution. When you end up actually building the circuit, you will notice that there will be certain deviations appearing. One of the big limitations of LC filters are the real life components used to build them. But that is a topic for next time. For now, hope you enjoyed this video, and if so, there are more similar videos on my channel that you might want to check out. And if you want to be up to date with my latest releases, also consider subscribing. See you next time. Bye bye.